I've had the misfortune of coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now that I'm a bit older. But when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say I was very naive. Back when I was 20, my family and I, my mom and my little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to a town down south. It was a big change, and as I had been having a bit of a hard time, I welcomed the change of scenery. It was a really beautiful town in an affluent part of the country, but I struggled to find a job and became very frustrated as my mom needed a bit of help with money. Over the course of about three months, we became fairly friendly with a middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. Let's call him Phil. If he ever saw us doing some shopping, he would always come and chat and ask how the family was, and he genuinely seemed like a decent and caring guy. So, when he said that he might have a job for me in a shop with a small flat upstairs that I could rent for next to nothing, I thought, okay, great, maybe things are looking up for me. Phil got our address, and he told me and my mom that he would pop by early evening when he had finished and take me to the car to go see the flat. I get myself looking, f I get myself looking fairly casual but presentable, and I'm feeling excited and confident now, thinking, wow, I got a job and a flat. I've killed two birds with one stone here. I just need to show him I'm sophisticated and I will make a great employee. Around 8 p.m., he knocks on the front door and my mom answers. He tells her we'll probably only be gone for about a half an hour, and he'll have me back safe and sound in no time. Now, I didn't take my phone with me as I didn't have any credit to call out with, and I didn't think I would be needing it for a quick trip up to the road and back. In hindsight, it was a pretty stupid thing to do. Maybe if I had my phone on me, it would have deterred him from what he was about to do. So, it's already dark out as it's March. I get into his car and we start driving and he's chatting away, asking how I am and telling me what the flat is like, when within a matter of a few minutes, I've noticed that we're not taking the conventional route that usually takes us directly into town. At first, I think he's just taking me down some sort of shortcut around the town to get to it, and I begin to reason with myself that he probably knows the area better than I do, so I try not to question it. Around 30 seconds later, I begin to realize that he's taking me in the complete opposite direction to where we were going, and I can tell that we're driving away from the populated town and into an area with nothing but trees and swamp on both sides of the road. My brain is now working overtime, thinking, where the heck is this guy taking me? And I just about manage to keep my composure, and I ask him outright, where are we going? Town's back the other way. I just thought I would take you on a little tour. It's beautiful here. Many forests and peaceful places I would love to show you, he tells me in his normal cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything in that moment because the logical and reasoning sides of my brain were in full-blown war. I'm trying to keep calm and thinking to myself, okay, he seems fairly normal. Why wouldn't he want to show me around? I mean, it is a stunning area full of natural beauty. He's probably just really proud to show me where he lives. The logical side, however, disagreed, and a wave of panic came over me. A little voice enters my head and begins to shout how stupid I am and that I need to get out of this situation. So I just sit there in silence, taking in the scenery which is becoming more sinister by the second, because at that moment in time, I didn't know what to think of all this. All I know is every cell in my body is screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. I started looking for signposts, houses, any distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything that I would be able to use to recognize my way back if I had to bolt from his car. Phil can obviously sense that I'm really nervous, so he's just talking away at me about what the job's like and how his staff are really friendly. And before I know it, he's slowed down to a crawl, and he's turned onto a little dirt road with a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open fields on the other. My stomach literally drops and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his car because the reality of what is about to potentially happen hits me like a freight train. I begin thinking to myself, if I jump out here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere. But my imagination starts flashing images of him grabbing me before I get a chance out the door. So I just sit there buckled in the passenger seat, not saying a word. I begin to think to myself that if he attacks me, don't make a sound. Don't give him the satisfaction of showing him I'm scared. My brain wasn't very useful at this point, and I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something, but I was just way too scared. We come out at the top of this little dirt road, 
and there is a tiny little car park surrounded by woodland with one car sat in it. It was clear there were people in there having sex, and as he pulls near the car I realize he has brought me to a local dogging spot. He then turns to me and puts his hand on my knee, and then says, We should do what they're doing, with a deadly serious expression on his face. I make this really bizarre, half-nervous laugh, half-garbled high-pitched whine, and try to laugh off the suggestion to show I'm not into it and that I'm super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle, which sounds like I've swallowed an entire potato, clearly freaks him out, and I'm mentally congratulating myself for my socially awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. Hey, it will be fun. No one will see us. He persists. No, I don't want to. Plus, I'm kind of seeing someone right now. I lie, but he just sits there smiling at me with a creepy smile like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of his weird face. My mom will be expecting me home now any minute. I tell him while trying not to make eye contact. I'm sure she won't mind you being out a bit longer with me. You can trust me. He tells me with a straight face as we sit next to the sex wagon parked next to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip, and I tell him again. My mom is waiting for me. She will start panicking if I'm not home within the next few minutes. Take me home. I look him straight in the face, and he knows that I'm not messing around now. Okay, that's fine. I'll take you back now. Without another word, he drives me out of that creepy seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seatbelt, ready to jump out. As we pull up outside our home, I breathe a sigh of relief as I can see my safety literally a few feet away, and before it can stop me, I run out and I slam the door right behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny little rope fence around our garden, he gets out of the car and my heart sinks. I think I'll pop in to see your mom real quick. He tells me, and I swear I can see a smirk all over his face, but I know he's only doing this because he's freaking out, knowing dang well I'm going to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable, or scare me into keeping my mouth shut. Before I can try and talk him out of it, my mom heard us pull up and open the front door. I barge right past her with one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen, grab a small knife out of the drawer, and fly into my little sister's room like a mad woman. Don't you dare freaking leave this room no matter what you hear. I tell her. Seeing the knife I am stuffing up my sleeve, she just looks at me with panic in her eyes and says back, Okay. I walk back into the living room and the cheeky twat is now sat on the sofa sprawled out comfortable as crap like he's at home. I begin to see red like swear to god I felt like I was the Hulk. I'm totally ready for him. I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa that my mom is sitting on. The absolute furthest away from him I can manage and he's just sitting there making small talk with my mom. All the while keeping his beady little weasel eyes on my every move. Why don't you come over here and sit over next to me? He pats on the sofa cushion next to him. No, I'm alright over here, but thanks. I tell him as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of him. Why are you sat over there? Come, come here. Honestly, I won't bite. He laughs and pats on the seat next to him yet again. No, really, I'm quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. This time through gritted teeth. My poor mom, bless her heart, is looking at each of us during this back and forth like a tennis match, and I can see something is registering her eyes. She can see my behavior is all off. I'm half stood, half sat down, and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as crap and staring my mom in the face very intensely, mentally trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. In that moment, I must have looked insane. Well, it's getting late now, so I think you should go. She finally speaks. My mom is starting to look anxious now as she's finally figured out that something has happened and that something went wrong that night. Phil gets up and agrees and mumbles about having to check something at his shop when he walks by me and is nearly out of the room when he pauses and turns to me and then puts his hand to shake mine. I'm thinking to myself, what a freaking weird thing to do. I take the opportunity to kindly offer him my hand that had the knife. Taking it with a bit more force than is polite, he soon yanked his grubby mid out of mine when the tip of the blade had jabbed him. He looked down and saw the blade and then right back at me. I gave him a look with such disgust. Phil hightailed it out of our home so fast without another word. I told my mom everything and she was fuming. 
We did discuss going to the police, but there wasn't really a crime aside from him being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned to a couple of girls around my age who lived down our street, they all clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I guessed he probably had done this type of thing before to other girls as well. Not too long after that incident, we decided to move away from that area. I'm so glad to report that I've never seen that smug face of his ever again. Thank God. I'd like to begin by describing myself because I believe it's relevant to the story. I'm a 25-year-old male and a bit above average height. I've been doing sports five to six times a week since I've graduated high school. Gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high-altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break in my boots last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my granddad's birthday, and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots were pretty overkill for these woods, but I needed to try them out. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It had rained just the day before, so I expected a fair amount of mud and not so many people, as they're usually easily scared off by the weather. Since the summer was excruciatingly hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not-so-distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and she doesn't enjoy long-distant walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up I would be doing this hike all alone. The first half of the hike was perfect. The altitude difference along the trail was minimal. I barely broke a sweat and I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most six to seven people during the first two to three hours, and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. This road is asphalt but deep in the forest and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I hear a car approach from behind me. It went past me, but not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older green SUV with a fresh registration. You can tell by the license plate. Probably an import. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time, but then I heard it come back. It drove past me for now the second time, now very slowly. I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble slash beard game going on as well. I assumed that they were gamekeepers even though those cars have a crest on the hood and on both front doors as well. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things. I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this. They have jeeps which are far more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort and again, I thought nothing of it. Then my trail left the asphalt road and I began snaking in the woods again. I walked ahead serenely, gazing at the trees and whatnot. Then I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. There was an engine sound that was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point the trail was quite narrow but if for whatever reason you'd want to drive a car on it, you could just about. Now, when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face now. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver who was staring back. I calmly asked him, What's wrong? Shall I let you go? In a polite tone as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing, and he soon disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that, unlike earlier, now he was alone in the car. I listened intently, standing still, since I wasn't sure what was going on. So at this point I wasn't scared, but there was definitely a faint feeling of unease in the air, 
and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I now turned around and began walking towards my destination at a much faster pace than before. Now I was getting scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without saying a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again, or to see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for the unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to take a leak. I saw a perfect spot to do so. A very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up it, and began peeing. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I had been camping there for a good few minutes before I headed back at the trail from where I deviated to take a leak. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I began to think to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind. Absolutely nothing. This made me realize just a moment later how alone I truly was. Except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back on that trail, since the small one to the tower was hidden by trees and you couldn't see the main trail, as it was running perpendicularly to the small one. I looked at him, and I was instantly chilled to the bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing with a baseball hat on. The only reason he was standing still, I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident of the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail not thinking much of it other than he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV from which the second man was missing, something inside me instantly snapped. In hindsight, I'd also like to add that it's illegal to hunt in these woods this time of the year. I figured in the matter of two seconds that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion towards and past the tower as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right though, it's the best call I will have ever made. And for Christ's sake, he began running towards me. Adrenaline blossoming within me, I began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was completely exhausted. If I had to guess, it must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for a signal but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while, I began power walking but still off trail, straight ahead in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone finally got a signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot. Well, I'll let you decide for yourselves if I did or not. Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this large forest. It fell like eternity, but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper, and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to a station near my car, rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in, and then drove home. My dog welcomed me back like I was coming home from a two-year deployment. Dogs are just amazing. She must have felt that something shook me up. I spent the whole afternoon contemplating my life in the bathtub. My new boots destroyed my feet, but they are meant to be sprinted in for large periods of time. At least I broke them in. I decided to call the forest gamekeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I came across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're usually alone. I told them my story and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been reading local news, but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet.
I really hope nothing else happens. A few years ago, when I was 11, girl, and my brother was six, a new person started being seen in the neighborhood. I know in most places that's not a big deal, but we live in a really small town. Everyone knows everyone else and their business, and all the kids play together even though we're all different age groups. No one had seen this guy before. He was probably around 40, had long ratty hair, scruffy face, and an old dirty jacket. Nothing weird happened, but it was just strange that no one had seen him before. A few weeks went by, and at least once every other day me and my friends would see him somewhere, just walking around the neighborhood while we rode our bikes or played tag up and down the streets. Still, nothing really strange about it. Then one day, me, my brother, and two older boys in the neighborhood, 13 and 14, were walking down the train tracks in the woods that stretch behind all our houses. We thought we could hear walking behind us, but everyone goes down there to walk their dogs, so we didn't care at first. The footsteps, however, kept getting louder and faster, until finally the older boy turned around and saw the guy jogging in our direction. He told us to run down the path towards his backyard and tried to talk to the guy. The guy just kept jogging and didn't say anything, moving right past him towards us. We all ran to the boy's house and told his parents. They called the cops and shortly after, two police came and talked to us and searched around the tracks. They said they didn't find anyone, but could see some footprints that looked like an adult that had been running in the other direction, away from the houses. They said we did the right thing, and if anything weird happened, to tell the adult and call again. <sighs> A week or so went by, and we still didn't see the strange man. Until one day, me and my brother were playing in the backyard, and I heard something in the woods. I looked over, and I could see the guy in the bushes watching us. I screamed. My stepdad came outside, and the guy was once again gone. My stepdad called the police. They came, and pretty much said the same things as before. A few more days went by, and still no one saw the strange man. One afternoon, my stepdad took me and my brother into the woods to go play on a big rope swing that had been there forever. The rope swing was deep in the woods on the opposite side of the tracks from where our house was. We were playing there for a while and we heard footsteps walking down the tracks just like before. They stopped close to the path to the rope swing and then we heard rustling in the bushes. My stepdad grabbed me, told me very calmly and quietly to take my brother and go down a different path that led to the next street, run to the store that was close by, and wait there for him. I took my brother and made him walk in front of me. Just before we turned around a bend, I looked back in time to see my stepdad walking towards the noise. He pulled something out of his jacket and gave it a flick. It looked from that distance like a big collapsible metal billy club sort of thing. He kept walking, and I ran to the store. We went inside. I got some ice cream for my little brother and told Linda, the lady who worked there, what happened. She told us to sit down and made a phone call of her own. I thought she called the police at the time, but now I'm not so sure. Thinking about it now, I believe she actually called my stepdad. She talked on the phone for a few seconds and then hung up. She looked worried, but relieved at the same time. She told us to stay there and that everything was going to be okay. About an hour later, my stepdad came into the store. He hugged us, talked to Linda quietly, and then took us home. I asked him what happened, and all he said was, 
It's all good. Everything's fine now. <sighs> no one's seen that strange guy since. This post is short and sweet and to the point. It's been the only time I was truly in danger. I was around six years old. My family and I were just leaving the supermarket. I was begging my mom for some candy, and by the time we left, I didn't get any, so I threw a huge fit. I started stomping and crying at the exit and threatened my mom that I wouldn't leave without getting any. She said, fine, stay here then, and left me at the exit. This made me cry and scream even louder. As she was getting closer to the car, a strange man approached me. He just said these simple words. Get in my van, boy. We will catch her. I stopped crying immediately, as I knew by then what stranger danger was. I looked at the guy and knew something bad would happen if I went with him. My mom quickly rushed back, grabbed my hand, and yanked me away. She didn't say a word to the man, but she gave him a death glare. Needless to say, I was quiet the whole ride back home. I'm not sure what would have happened if my mom decided to pack the groceries before she came back to get me from my little fit. I know this is short and anything could have happened, but I still remember those words all these years later. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you have your own personal scary story, be sure to submit that to my subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash southerncannibal or to my email at southerncannibal at gmail.com. I'm always looking for new stories. And before we bring this video to a close, I just want to shout out all of my $5 or more patrons as well as my $3 or more patrons featured on screen. Shout out to... Babe Lincoln, Beth A, Kate T, Katrina T, Celeste S, Ellie S, Heather B, Howard R, Jazzy G, Jonathan C, Joseph F, Lori J, Matthew B, Steph L, Tammy S, Terry H, too ecky for you, and Victor R. Thank all of you so much for supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate it more than you know. And if any of you would like to join these awesome people and also become a patron, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash southerncannibal. Thank you everyone, and have a good one. And remember to always... <laughs>